Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for Face the State. I'm Tracy Townsend. This morning, we are starting with an exclusive sit down interview with Dr. Amy Acton. We talked about her experience as director of the Ohio Department of Health, how she guided the state through that early part of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons learned along the way. How will you advise the state um, as we continue to live with this in terms of, you know, how do we navigate this new world? You talked about grace and mercy. What else do we need to do? Well, you know, maybe, you know, I'm not in a position of advising and certainly when you're in those roles, you have a lot of behind the scene knowledge that mm -hmm. not all of us have, but I maybe would say more to people at home. Um, something I recognized very early on in this pandemic by accident, I happened to be in the White House the last week of February, I had a very strong sense this was already here, and um, but we didn't know it yet. It wasn't being said. I, I joke around that I Googled the word pandemic because even though I taught global public health because I wondered why we hadn't yet called it that. Um, I, I really feel that this was always a war on a common enemy. Um, if this was a virus, one of the hardest things about public health is a lot of what you do and when you knock it out of the park and you get it right, you don't see what we just prevented. <laughs> and, and similarly with this virus, it's just been the worst, almost science fiction like nemesis um, that you couldn't make up if you're trying to make up a movie called Contagion. Um, be, and, and, but it's something we all have in common. At, it, at the very thrust of it, it is an enemy that the entire world shares and you have to respect the enemy. Maybe sometimes we don't always respect nature and just the ways of the world. Um, and so this is still out there and there, there are, you know, we know that the conditions are right, that we probably will see this more often than we did. It might not be nearly a hundred years. Um, um, so we have to learn to live like with the knowledge of this as being part of our ecosystem. So you talked <laughs> about collective trauma and I want to go from there and ask you about um, how you think that trauma, the, the time period of the past two years yeah. is going to impact us in the, in the next five to 10 years. And I'm thinking about mental health. Yeah. And I'm really thinking about our children and our families. Absolutely. Um, they always knew, so many people don't know that um, it was actually after 9-11, uh, George W. Bush read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza. Um, and we were trying to figure out uh, what were the gravest security risks to our country, and they realized that it was actually a global pandemic um, or a biologic weapon would actually unmoor us. Um, it's not just the virus. As we've learned, there's a contagion far worse than a virus, and that is fear and our intolerance for ambiguity. And it's in this unmooring that we experience that they predicted even back then, and this playbook got passed from president to president, they predicted all sorts of unrest would occur. They predicted that there would be these disruptions of global supply chains. They predicted that there would be bad actors that would take advantage of the facts that we were all unmoored. And they called it cascading consequences. And so it's not just enough to make a policy decision. As I've always said, you can't mandate your way or do a policy. We had to teach all of us how to live with this and throw an emergency break in the beginning. What strikes you most in terms of um, what we learned through all of this? And so I'm hoping some of the lessons of moving forward from COVID are about how we are gonna seize our life and seize our health and our well-being. How do we want to live? I hope we also see that is, you know, one of the biggest lessons of public health that I teach is that we gained 30 years life expectancy in the last century, but only five of it was due to everything I learned in medical school, fixing broken things or things that are in our individual control. Almost all of our increased life expectancy came from things that we have to solve together. 
Our interview was wide ranging. You can watch Face the State next week to hear more of what Dr. Acton has to say, including what she says is next for her and how she sees her place in history. It's very unlikely that Ohio has a full primary election on May 3rd. This comes after the state Supreme Court rejected another set of district maps, calling them unconstitutional. 10 TV asked Governor DeWine about a solution. He says the commission could pass a resolution to hiring three map makers, two Republican and one Democrat, put them in a room and have them follow three rules. Follow the law. We have to follow the Supreme Court decision, but we also have to follow what the Constitution tells us. We have to do all of those, try to do all of those at the same time and do them within 10 days. I don't know any other way of doing that. Now, as the governor mentioned, they have just a matter of days to come up with another map, which he agrees will be a tough challenge. The newly signed constitutional carry bill will become law in less than three months. What exactly does that mean? Well, under this new law, you can conceal carry if you are 21 or older and legally own the gun. Also under this law, no training or permit to carry the gun is necessary. This news is sparking some confusion, including where people can and cannot take a gun. 10 TV's Kevin Landers explains what you need to know. One index finger stays off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Starting this June. Gun out in parallel with your dominant eye. Training like this will no longer be required if you want to carry a concealed weapon in Ohio. It's a change Joe King welcomes, sort of. Training is very important when it comes to anything, really, but if you're going to carry a firearm responsibly, you need to make sure you know how to operate it. Ohio's change in permitless concealed carry won't eliminate a business's right to ban guns on their property. Places like the Columbus Zoo, theaters, most restaurants, or CODA buses will continue to ban weapons on their property. Many wonder if crime will be on the rise with more gun owners concealing firearms who've never been trained. The gun lobby says no. We asked Stanford law professor John Donahue, who has written extensively on gun issues. The number of gun thefts will undoubtedly skyrocket in, in Ohio as more people start carrying guns because they tend to leave them in their car. I think there have been 14 published studies that have found that right to carry will increase crime. Ohio will join 22 states to pass permitless concealed carry. Gun stores like this one say they expect to see a drop off in people taking gun safety classes because it's no longer required. But that doesn't mean they say they won't encourage people to take the classes anyway. Well, you need to make sure you not just have a firearm, but you have the skills, tools, and knowledge to safely carry a firearm. Kevin Landers, 10 TV News. Governor Mike DeWine is facing a lot of criticism for signing this most recent bill. 10 TV's Brittany Bailey asked him to respond to the backlash. About half the states now have this provision. And this is, I think, consistent with uh, the United States Constitution. That's the response from Governor Mike DeWine after he signed the controversial constitutional carry law this week. The law allows any legal gun owner to carry a weapon without a permit. The NRA praised the move, but many law enforcement organizations and Democrats have condemned it. The law also means if you get pulled over, you don't have to tell an officer if you have a gun. Most police departments have told us uh, that what they will do, that that will simply become part of the protocol. That when a police officer walks up, there's always some questions that they uh, are supposed to ask, that their department tells them to ask. That will be uh, probably the first question that they'll ask. This would be the second law Governor DeWine has signed in the past two years that has been praised by Second Amendment supporters. Just last year, he signed the Stand Your Ground law, which also drew a lot of criticism. This all comes nearly three years after this moment. Just a couple of months later, Governor DeWine rolled out the strong Ohio bill, which quickly fizzled out in the legislature. We pressed him on that today. What do you say to the people who have shouted for you to do something and we've signed two different laws instead of that? We're still asking the state legislature to take action on a bill, which I think is a is a, frankly a no-brainer. And that simply is, it says that violent repeat offenders who commit most of the violent crime today if they are in possession of a gun, the judge should have the ability to put them away for at least 10 years. And that was 10 TV's Brittany Bailey reporting. That bill that Governor DeWine mentioned is House Bill 383. It was introduced last August and referred to committee in September. There's been no movement since then. All right, we want you to take a look at this powerful scene at the State House from this week. 200 crime survivors walked the Capitol steps to push for more protection for victims. 
The group is calling for employment and housing protections through several bipartisan bills. Before we break down what the bills would do, let's hear from the voices of the victims. What do you want? Jay! What do you want? Jay! What do you want? Jay! My name is Rukaya Zafra Abdul Mutaklim, and I am the mother of Suleiman Abdul Mutaklim. We need the peace. His yes. life was brought to an end. June 29th at 10.30, three assailants walked up behind him, shot him in the back of the neck. And what I saw were children. And I didn't know that until I was in the courtroom of juvenile court. We speak for those who are no longer here with us. I looked at them and I said, what happened to these children? Children are not born with weapons in their hands. If we do not step up and save our future, we have no future. So I'm here because he is saying, help them. Do not let this cycle of crime continue because the repeat of this cycle of trauma only gives us more cycle of crime. And my son is saying, please, please, please change, improve our laws. You can do this. Here's a breakdown of the changes the group is demanding. First, funding for additional trauma recovery centers. Extend unpaid leave for crime victims and their loved ones as they navigate legal battles and establish housing protections to allow victims to relocate safely. For a closer look at the bills, head over to 10tv.com slash featured links. A powerful message this week from the president of Ukraine to the United States. Up next, Ohio lawmakers in Washington, D.C. weigh in on whether we are doing enough to help. Today, today it's not enough to be the leader of the nation. Today it takes to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Peace in your country doesn't depend anymore only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you, on those who are strong. Strong doesn't mean weak. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky delivering an emotional address to the joint session of Congress this week. He pushed for the airspace over Ukraine to be closed and asked for more support. President Biden later announced the United States is sending more anti-aircraft and anti-armor weapons and drones to Ukraine. Here's how Ohio lawmakers in D.C. reacted to the Ukrainian president's message. When he's addressing us, the, the realness really starts setting in. Obviously, we're watching what's being displayed on TV and, and, and through media right now, and uh, we know. Um, our office is somewhat directed. We, we have a staffer that's uh, affected by um, the situation that's happening in Ukraine. But to be in the room, the quietness, the um, everyone was listening. You didn't see a lot of phones, which is pretty rare for members of Congress not to be on their telephone. When asked if the U.S. should create a no-fly zone, as Zelensky had requested, Representative Troy Balderson and Representative Mike Carey say that is going a step too far. The problem you have with the no-fly zone is once you do that, then, then you, you could have engagement from, um, from our country. Um, and, and I think we, we don't want to have American servicemen and women um, you know, fighting in, in, in Ukraine. I think we just need to do everything that we can to support both humanitarianly, both uh, militarily. Um, uh, but, but I just, uh, at this time, I do not believe it is the, it, it, it's the correct path for this country. Senator Rob Portman returned from Poland this week. He was helping refugees and you, for, who were coming from Ukraine. He had this to say about his experience. 
you see the worst of humanity and the best of humanity. The worst of humanity is these images we saw today when President Zelensky showed us the video and we see in our TVs and our online constantly. But we also saw the best of humanity in refugees helping one another, in refugees with an incredibly traumatic, sad story, but also hope and confidence that liberty will win out but they want our help. The president has been aggressive, but he's been cautious and he's moved. We've moved our allies as fast and quickly as we can to keep this coalition together. Uh, but the president has to be cautious about potentially um, escalating this war outside of, of Ukraine. And, um, and, and we've got to be very careful with the no-fly zone. What does this mean in terms of does that mean the Russians then use um, tactical nuclear weapons? So um, I think we've done this uh, in a unified way. We've, we've done most of what uh, President Zelensky needs us to do and has asked us to do. We'll continue to work with him. Meantime, people here in Ohio are doing whatever they can to help, and that includes a native living in Plain City. The Ukrainian government recruited him to support his home country. That task includes collecting supplies to send over and advocating to lawmakers to do what they can to help. 10 TV's Lindsay Mills has his story. Where I was born, where I was raised. When Vladimir so Jelezny left Ukraine in 1991, I, uh, this flag was not a symbol of his home yet. The country wasn't independent, still part of the Soviet Union. I decided to escape the empire of evil. He and his wife arrived in Plain City, where they have lived since. I do not think I can find the right words to, to express. Watching the war unfold, he feels helpless. He applauds the leadership of Ukraine's president, who addressed Congress Wednesday. He is standing on uh, truth. He is really addressing the problem. He is uh, trying to gather the whole humanity of, uh, of the world to stop the senseless bloodshed. Days ago, he received a letter from the Ukrainian government seeking his help to gather money, supplies, and advocate to elected officials. He signed the paperwork, and he's getting started, creating a foundation. I wish for Ukraine to have that kind of clear, blue, and peaceful skies as we do forever. That was 10 TV's Lindsay Mills reporting. The videos coming out of Ukraine are so difficult to watch. Military forces launching explosives to families fleeing their homes for safety. Mental health experts and advocates say people are absolutely having a physical and mental reaction to what they are seeing. Ken Yeager from the Stress, Trauma and Resilience Program at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center told me the images make it hard not to view the world as a less safe place. If they're coming through your devices, many of them are unfiltered. So they are very, very graphic. And it leads one to question, oh my gosh, can one human being do this to another? It absolutely is a way of, of helping yourself by helping others. Um, are you doing okay with this? If it's a younger person, um, explaining that, you know, this is happening, it is real, but it's not here. It's a long way away. Um, with the older population talking about how are you feeling with this. By this summer, every state must establish a new mental health hotline. Is Ohio going to be ready? We'll tell you what's happening to get the 988 line up and running. An automation company celebrated the grand opening of its new facility in Lewis Center this week. ATS Industrial Automation will make machinery for General Motors automated battery pack assembly lines. The goal is to add up to 100 jobs this year to meet that demand. This is a place that you can be proud to work. We can be a part of that journey. We can build, we can grow, we can develop together and we can have future employees. We have the best in the country, the best in the world, and frankly, it's one of the reasons that uh, Ohio is red hot and people are coming here and people are, are in fact, expanding here. To learn more. 
Governor DeWine was a guest at the ribbon cutting ceremony and he took a spin in the all new electric Hummer. The company plans to add another 300 to 500 jobs by the year 2025. Another big job creator in our state, Intel, announced a big investment this week. Over the next decade, Intel is promising $100 million. It will help build a pipeline to education and research to help develop workers in semiconductor manufacturing. $50 million will go directly to Ohio higher education. Ohio leaders say there is a focus to develop STEM programs in minority communities. You know, as we look to the future in Ohio, uh, our goal is for every Ohioan to live up to their God-given potential, no matter where they're born, where, what their zip code is, where they grow up. The National Science Foundation is matching $50 million to help fund the research. The campus in New Albany is expected to bring in 7,000 construction jobs and 3,000 full-time positions. It's expected to be complete in the year 2025. Right now, if someone is experiencing a mental health crisis, they may call 911. But a new helpline is coming this summer. The new number to dial will be 988. The change is federally mandated, but each state needs to figure out how to implement it. For those in crisis, advocates say 988 will be more than just a number, but a new approach to our crisis response systems. 10TV's Kiana Deiches explains if Ohio is ready. People are dying at a rapid pace and people are being touched by that in all spectrums of life. For years, Yavez Ellis has been helping people navigate trauma. One situation in particular, a homicide, led him to counsel teens. These young people had to wait because the body had fell behind their car. So these young people couldn't just roll over the body and leave the scene. They had to sit and wait and, and watch somebody pass away. He says sharing resources to help them deal with those emotions made all the difference. What is the address of your emergency? Soon he'll be able to direct them to a new national hotline. Instead of calling 911 if you're experiencing a mental health crisis, you'll dial 988. When someone's in a crisis, it's very hard to think of the right number to call or who you have to look for or to look something up, that's really hard. But is Ohio prepared to make the process easier? Yes. Gross. Yes. An Ohio House committee voted to add the creation of the hotline to House Bill 468, which now moves to the Senate. The program is mandated by the federal government, but will be paid for by the state. Here, it's fully funded for the first 18 months. We are looking at the next GA then to be able to make the decisions about the continuous funding based on the reports back from the committee. Meanwhile, Adam H. is making preparations to launch the hotline in four months. Well, I think it's going to be a push to get there by mid-July. I have no doubt that we'll do it. When they do, Ella says it'll be a lifeline for mental health. And hopefully, we begin to teach it like we teach 911, that when you're dealing with crisis, we're hoping that you can call this number to be able to help you feel less suicidal, less depressed, less overwhelmed. And that was Kiana Deitches reporting for us. 988 will go live in every state by July 16th. For now, if you are in distress, you can call the existing National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number is right there on your screen, 1-800-273-8255. Thank you all so much for joining us here today on Face the State. Have a great week.